Meet Freddie Canute, a former African Footballer of the Year and one of the top strikers to play in La Liga and the Premier League. He's a man devoted to his faith, believing deeply in the importance of giving back. And through his charity, the Canute Foundation, he's been helping thousands of people in need. I had a chance to catch up with Freddy Canute in Istanbul to hear his fascinating story. Even when you were the star player so far, I felt like Usman Dembele at the new <laughs> This is the interview. Frederick Omar Kanuti, it's a pleasure meeting you. Thank you so much for joining us on the interview. Thank you very much, my pleasure. There's a lot I want to talk to you about, mm -hmm. and I think there's a lot of ground that we will end up covering, especially, I'm look, especially looking forward to getting to football. Mm -hmm. But I want to ask you about your foundation, something that means a lot to you, that has done immense work in Mali and elsewhere. Tell me more about it. Well, it got f funded uh, in about 2000 and between 2005, 7, but there was no much activity at the beginning. The, the initial stage was for me to really always with the intention to give back, to do, to do something. I think throughout my career, I always uh, tried to do something. I felt that I was privileged. I was uh, uh, through my passion, my, ta my talent and passion and the work I've done, uh, I had a, a stage, I had, I had a platform. Uh, and, and I thought that I, my duty as well was to give back something. So that's how it started. And at the beginning, I didn't really know what I wanted to do exactly, but I, I, I always wanted to uh, work in education, youth development, generally speaking, and most particularly uh, orphans as well. Uh, my dad come from a country um, where, unfortunately, the, 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 there's a lot of orphans. He was an orphan himself, and it was one of his dreams as well. So I'm kind of the con continuity, a continuation of, of what he, or extension of what he would have liked to do. Um, and um, and yes, yeah, so that's why we uh, created uh, in 2000, and we opened in 2010 uh, Sakina Children Village, which is a, a, a children to cater for the needs of um, orphans and the most vulnerable children in, in Mali. How has it been since then? Um, a lot of challenges. Obviously, when you have, uh, yeah, when you dream of something or you want to achieve something, um, and before you translate this into reality, everything seems seems easy. Oh, I'm going to do this and that. But you know, I came across a lot of uh, challenges, uh, organizational, etc. It's not too easy at all. And um, so I've learned a lot from, from this ex uh, experience. Um, and, uh, and yeah, we, we, we've changed a little bit the shape, the spirit stayed the same, but we, 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 we've changed a little bit the, the, the shape uh, and the activities uh, we've, we, we focus ourselves in. So there is the, so there is the, 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 yeah, the taking care of the orphans, there is the education panel, there is the uh, um, skills uh, center, training skills, like uh, skills training center. Uh, there is a lot of uh, part within that, that project that, um, that developed uh, along the years. Sustainably funded? Yes, that was, I mean, this, uh, it was very important for me from the beginning. Uh, my idea and, and my um, goal was not to fund it myself. Uh, okay, I gave the initial push, but for me, uh, uh, for a project to be uh, successful, it has to be sustainable. So my idea, my idea was really to make sure that uh, on the ground over there, uh, they could, um, yeah, uh, be self-sufficient. So there are a lot of activities, agricultural uh, activities, uh, skills training center, and and yeah, so that they can sell what they produce or things. Like we haven't reached uh, full self-sufficiency uh, uh, yet, but yeah, this is definitely the um, the objective from the from the beginning. 
I speak to so many people who get involved in the field of philanthropy and most of them tell me in addition to what I'm doing for them ultimately it's what it's doing for my own soul. Yeah. When you're on the ground in Mali, when you see the foundation doing its work and seeing the kids benefiting from it, how does that feel? Yeah, it feels good. Yeah, it's, it's, it's funny because sometimes you don't know who benefits who the most. Uh, so that's the way I, I see things. Um, um, I've always considered that, I mean, the, the, it, it reminds me a hadith of our beloved Prophet who says that the most like, uh, the, bet, the best among you is the one who is more beneficial to people, you know. And it, this is something that I feel is, um, yeah, is, 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 uh, has always been important uh, to me how to, how to give. I don't want to picture myself as someone like who does only that. No, it's only part, uh, I'm all, only doing the little thing I, uh, I can do. Um, and yeah, it, it does a great uh, good, I hope, for the, them over there who are the recipients of these activities and also for the one who, are, who is doing it uh, because I think that's also a way to find your balance and your purpose in life. Tell me a little bit more about that, that process and that journey in finding your purpose in life. So, in your early 20s you have a sort of awakening, mm -hmm. you want to connect with Islam Omar was always your middle name, yeah. right? So you came from a, a mixed background, yeah, exactly, a, a exactly, Muslim exactly. slash Christian yeah, background, yeah, yeah. right? Uh, grew up in France. Mm -hmm. Tell me about the moment things switched for you and you decided that you wanted to follow this path in your own way. Yeah, oh, well, this is a very deep question because uh, for me it wasn't only one moment because it started, as you said, I'm a mixed background as well, so I always had a kind of a connection with, with this Islam anyway. Um, and, but, but I consider myself as a convert or revert, you call it, or however you want, and, uh, because I didn't know much or almost anything about Islam when I grew up. Uh, but somehow I remember I remember when I was around 10 or 11 years old I did my first day of Ramadan I don't remember exactly what was the purpose but I remember my dad telling me he was fasting when he was young etc and I had some friends also growing up in the uh, Lyon suburbs you always mix up with uh, uh, different uh, nationalities and religions etc and for some reason, I think it started very young for me, that um, call, I would say, or that awakening or that awareness. Uh, I remember questioning uh, myself about, uh, about God, about um, uh, is he watching us all the time, is he, you know? And uh, it was always something that was um, attracting me uh, for some reason, but it's really, um, when uh, at the beginning of my adulthood, when I was around 18, 19, I started to really uh, learn a little bit about different religions and mainly Islam. And that was the one that uh, was responding to most of my questions. And it's a time when you become an adult where you kind of look for yeah, a purpose, I would say. And for, for me, yeah, I think I had this uh, at a quite a young age, I felt that there, is, there was something else. I couldn't just, I couldn't just like enjoy, do my eat, go work, play football, come back. I f always felt that there was something uh, else that we were meant to uh, fulfill um, our potential and uh, to fulfill uh, one's potential, I felt that there was uh, this unquestionable connection with God we, we, we need to have. And that's the way I felt it. And when I discovered Islam and I started to study it, I felt that uh, sincerity in the, in the message, that um, yeah, purity, sincerity, um, that di direct contact and connection you could, you could develop uh, with with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that I think that's uh, yeah to make it brief that's really something that I had and kept growing uh, in me uh, through through the years was it a challenge for you to reject the conventional footballers lifestyle yeah to be honest no 
things come easy. Yeah. Women. Yeah. Money. Yeah. Parties. I think uh, anyway. I think the the, the uh, resisting is 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 a good word, but I see it. I don't uh, particularly um, link it to football. I think everybody we need to. I mean, every believer needs to resist to something because the normally what comes easy is not good doesn't have a good outcome or good result. And what requires work and effort and resilience and patience, etc., normally is something that is lasting and something that is going to be good for your life. And I think I've realized that quite early. So as a footballer, no, also, it wasn't such a big resistance for me because I was, I think I've never been really, really naturally attracted to some stuff. Uh, I'm, I'm absolutely not t saying I'm a saint, etc. I've done like a lot, a lot of mistakes, and before even I convert to Islam, etc. I've known a, a different lifestyle, etc., etc. But I think I got tired um, very, very quickly. So, so this is not something I, I had to make a major effort to resist to. Uh, so, no, I've never really been attracted to fancy cars and. Uh, very expensive clothing and stuff like this and or nightclubs etc this is not something that uh, attracted me at all so for me it was quite uh, quite easy <laughs> so there you were center forward for Lyon West Ham Spurs Sevilla finished off in China but at at a point at a point in time it was okay Freddie Canute fantastic footballer plays for these clubs, plays for Mali internationally, um, clean living, devout Muslim. But there's a moment when things become political. There's war raging in Gaza. The Israelis are attacking the Gaza Strip. December 2008, January 2009, you score a goal, you lift your Sevilla top up and underneath is a Palestine t-shirt. Tell me what happens next. Uh, what, happened, <laughs> what happened next? To be honest, I, I didn't foresee uh, what was going to happen next. Uh, for me, it was just like uh, a moment that was unbearable uh, to stay silent about. And yeah, this is funny because we talk about that now, but it, it has come again so many times after that, you know? So it's been more than... 10 years and before that yeah when i refer also, to the gaza war i exactly. have to be specific which one right? exactly yeah. exactly unfortunately we always have to be specific about which one which attack and and yeah for me it was like a long uh injustice uh that is carrying on now and being always normalized and uh and yeah, the, 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 the double standard as well. Uh, a lot of things came to my mind and I found this at that moment. Um, it was, yeah, it was um, not bearable to, to just accept and say nothing. So I just decided to use the little platform I had to, uh, to and people love football, watch football. And I'm, I'm fortunate enough to play striker and to score some goals sometimes. A lot of goals, for Sevilla especially. <laughs> so, yeah. Did you feel like you were, were you, were you thinking of doing something like this, but that was the time that you felt ready to sort of go public with a political protest that entangles and, and intersects with your religious identity and yeah. all these other things? Yeah, I think it requires a little bit of maturity, mm. knowing that something's going to happen. So you have to be ready. So when you, you decide to, uh, to cross that line, I don't even like to cross that line because for me, I was, I was doing something good, like it's done every day now uh, in, in, in support uh, to uh, Ukraine, support to all kind of communities. It's always been done. Black Lives Matter. Black yeah. Lives ma Matter and so on. So, why not uh, doing that across the board? So that's the question, and that's the uncomfortable uh, question that uh, I asked at that moment. So I knew there was going to have repercussion about that, but I was ready for that. And to be honest, I didn't really care. It's afterwards I realized that, oh, okay. So yeah, people are just showing their face now. 
and, and making it uh, official that there are things that are, there are injustices that are politically correct and others not. That's what Did it hurt you that you, I mean, you got fined? Yeah. I mean, I'm assuming they didn't financially ruin you. Mm -hmm. It was more symbolic, no, no, no. you got yeah. fined. But did it hurt you that a lot of people couldn't see why you were doing it and couldn't see the intentions behind it? I think a lot of, uh, yeah, first of all, I think we have to, um, to stay positive because the amount of support I've received was like just mm. overwhelming. Uh, so, so I have to recognize that. And across the board, in Spain, in France, in Muslim or non-Muslim countries, etc. So, so it, it kind of reassured me as well that, oh, okay, uh, there are still people who um, have the courage to, uh, to, yeah, to stand against injustice, uh, no matter what color or banner it carries, you know. And, um, and yeah, so that's the positive thing. And after, yeah, uh, as I said, when it's something it's politically incorrect, uh, you get a fine, you get, a, for me, it wasn't a big deal. The message went through, uh, it's very little. People talk about it until today, so it's positive. But of course, it's, it's very little in that, um, in, in respect with the, with, the, with, with the size of the injustice, I would say. I want to talk a little bit about the multifaceted identities that a lot of mm -hmm. French people of North African descent, West African descent, etc., from a Muslim background come with. You grew up in France, you played for Lyon, you played for the French youth teams, right? You, it seems to me you were one of the first that said, I don't want to play internationally for France if I'm going to be called up. I would prefer to play for my ancestral home, mm -hmm. for Mali. Nowadays, it seems to be quite normalized. Yeah. I mean, half the Moroccan team seems to have been born somewhere in Europe, yeah. right? In, in France, in, in the Netherlands, in Belgium, and so on. So you were one of the first at that point in time in the 2000s. Tell me why you did it, why it was so important to you, and, and why you think it's now more normal for, yeah. for people who carry the French passport or the Belgian passport or the Dutch passport to say, actually, I want to play for my parents' country or the country that I'm from, not yeah. this country. Yeah, I think, yeah, and again, it was a very personal uh, approach for me. Um, I didn't, obviously, at the time, claim to, uh, to, be, uh, to carry a torch for some other people who were going to follow me, etc. No, it was a personal um, uh, uh, approach, uh, and, and I just felt that there was something to be done the other way around. Um, I always say that there is so much like human and even material uh, resources that have been pillaged from, from Africa. I think it's good that uh, some of the human resources and knowledge and know-how goes back there and to help uh, lift the country in, in, in whatever capacity it is. Sometimes it's through sports and sports nowadays has so much uh, leverage we can do so much things through sports. It can influence so, so many people. So I, I, I didn't think about all this when I was uh, at the beginning, but after, uh, it wasn't an easy de decision because I was kind of called up with uh, the, the uh, France uh, at the time. I was really on, 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 on the edge of, of being called up, etc. Around about the same age as Thierry Henry. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So yeah. you were sort of, Contemporaries. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, team. there were yeah. some top strikers, and yeah. I don't claim that I would have uh, played on the starting lineup. You for were France, good enough to be in the squad. But sure. I remember yeah. I yeah. actually was in the in the pre-squad of right. 30 players, etc. And it's at that moment, after all this work, I was so close to. So people didn't understand. See, but you were playing so well now. I was scoring a lot of goals at the beginning of the season with uh, with Tottenham, and everything was going well. And I decided at that moment to play for, for, for Mali. And I remember when I came back from the African Cup of Nations, that was played in the middle of the season, you remember? I, 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 didn't, I didn't play, um, I wasn't in the starting lineup anymore until the end of the season almost. So I paid the price for that. Yeah, there was that perception that when you have 
African players who play for African countries, yeah. they're going to disrupt your season because in January they're going to yes. be going off to Burkina Faso or exactly. where, wherever to, exactly. to eat up a month of the Premier yeah. League season, whereas they should be with yeah, us. Exactly. Right? Yeah. But especially in my case, it was different because the, the coach thought that I could play only for France. Yeah. So in the middle yeah. of the season, I said, no, I'm going to play for Mali. He said, so he did that when I came back, he did that as a punishment a little bit. So I was not playing. Which coach was that? Uh, it was uh, David uh, Pleat. He was a caretaker at, yeah. at that moment yeah. because we started the year at the time with uh, Glenn Hoddle. And he got sacked and it was Mar sacked. Martin Yol after that? No. Yeah, no, uh, yeah. Um, Pleat took Pleat, over Pleat and until Martin Yol yeah. uh, took over the following season. So yeah, it was the, the context, but uh, it's okay. I accepted that, that decision. I didn't play much until the end of the season, etc. But, but yeah, for, to come back on your, on your question is... Uh, for me, it was important to do something and I had always in the back of my mind that I wanted to do some charity work in Africa as well. So it was a way for me to give back right. and, and also to be able to, uh, to, to, to do my activities, my charitable activities uh, in, in the future. So I never regretted my decision, even if it wasn't easy right. uh, all these years playing for, for, for Mali. But I really enjoyed the writing. But do you feel like now you blazed that trail charted that path for the Riyadh Mahrezes of the world and, and others who can do it without much yeah. drama. Then yeah. People accept, oh no, he was born here, yeah. but he plays there and it's yeah. fine. And he plays for Algeria or Morocco yeah. or, or whoever. Yeah. And that's, I that's think fine. it's good. Unwillingly, I didn't do it on purpose, right. but um, I think it's good. And, and to be also clear, I don't blame uh, people from mixed background or African background to play for France. That's what makes the, 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 the quality also of the friendship. And I feel French as well. Mm. Uh, I'm French, um, but I'm African as well. I've never seen any conflict in my uh, identity. Uh, for me, I'm, I'm, I've never been like hyper nationalistic or nationalist. I'm, I'm just like, for me, this is not the most important thing. And I know what I feel. I know that I'm French, I have African background and I feel very well connected to Africa um, and, and I'm happy to have um, contributed to, uh, to, to helping the country and lifting the, the, the country up a little bit in my capacity um, and um, I, I hope I can keep doing so. You helped build Sevilla's first mosque in hundreds of years and you were also at your most prolific as a footballer at Sevilla. When you look back at your career, was your time in Sevilla your happiest as a, yeah. as a man, as a footballer? Yeah, I mean, Sevilla was, I mean, um, you didn't do it on purpose, but the question has been romanticized a little bit. It's not the first, uh, I, I helped, I contributed to save one of the mosques Same. at the time. So I had to uh, give a financial contribution. So the Muslims, they didn't have so many places of, of, to pray, uh, to pray in at the time. So I contributed to save one site that they had as a, as a mosque at the time. That's what, that's what I did. Alhamdulillah, I, see, I don't see that like, I don't say even that to boast or whatever. Is, is for me, it's just an honor, a privilege. Uh, if Allah put me in that position at that moment to be able to do so, Alhamdulillah, I'm more grateful than anything else. And, um, and now they are still trying to build the first purpose-built right. uh, mosque because, um, you know, I, how, how it is, it's difficult to, uh, to have uh, this kind of, uh, of, 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 of mosque uh, everywhere in Europe. So, um, I've been contributing and helping uh, um, raise awareness right. about the subject, yeah. Some rapid-fire football questions before we end, because yes. we're almost out of time. Best player you've ever played with? Oh, I'm really <laughs> bad in this stuff, <laughs> subhanAllah. Because, because there, are, there are so many and so good in different capacities. Oh, come it's on, very, very don't be diplomatic. That I played with. Um, I need to find uh, answer. Sh -sh -sh. For some reason, I would say maybe it's going to be a bit, uh, maybe not expected, but I would say maybe Dani Alves, mm. because I, he, 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 
He was more of a winger that time at Sevilla, mm -hmm. right? No, not, he, not a right he was, back, a, was, he he was, he right was back? a right back, oh. but he was playing in a way that I, I've never seen before. He, he redefined it. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. So, so that's why he was, as you said, you don't even know what position he was playing because he was playing like a number 10 sometimes, giving a lot of yeah. assists. And it, it, I describe him as a number 10 from the left back position. It was a bit crazy. So. I think, and um, he, 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 yeah, I remember him a lot because he had so much like energy and so always, always 100%, always happy, always, and he was, uh, he had an unusual way to play football. So you had Danny Alves and you had Jesus Navas. Yeah, I could, so I could mention no wonder, so many No wonder others. you scored all yeah, those goals. They were Luis feeding. Fabiano up yeah. front, uh, Jesus Navas, who was like my little brother, really? gave me so many uh, goals. Uh, we had we had a great team, and it was um, most importantly it was a good bunch of good guys. You know what I mean? Toughest defender you've ever played against? Uh, toughest, toughest, toughest. I would say I don't know. At the time of the, the invincible in in Arsenal, there was like Saul Campbell. Some it was tough and strong, but. Um, to be honest, I, you know, uh, yeah, it's 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 dif it's difficult. After there was like Cannavaro in Real Madrid. I remember I played against him. And you, I mean, times. he's he's small and you're massive. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah. How yeah. did he make it difficult? For yeah, him? I I think the 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 players that were clever were the m most difficult to play against. I was not uh, struggling so much uh, against power and strength. Uh, I liked as well when they were clever because it's like you, you try to uh, solve a problem. Football is problem solving anyway. And, um, and yeah, so many d different uh, defenders I had to adjust. That's why it's even hard for me to say one because they, you always had to solve a different problem. So that's what I loved about football and loved about being a, a striker and try to unlock uh, the, the, the thing. My most difficult question for you for the end, yeah. also football related, how did a team with Michael Carrick, David James, Joe Cole, Freddie Canute, Paolo Di Canio, Les Ferdinand for half a season, yeah. and a couple of others. I think Rio and Lampard were sold by then, but still yeah, you had a lot yeah, of, still, you had yeah, a pantheon. Yeah. How did they get relegated? Yeah, this is the million pound question. <laughs> this is crazy. All the West Ham fans are watching. Yeah, until now we haven't solved that, that, yeah, that, that issue, that problem. It, it was crazy, it was crazy. And I always felt kind of a, a little bit responsible on a personal level because I got injured quite a long spell during the season and I was like suffering and, and hurt not to be able to, to help and I just came back at the end of the season but it was also too late to really contribute and, and help uh, turn uh, tables you know so, so, so yeah it was difficult it, 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 when we see all the players that went that left from that particular team that year uh, Joko, Lampard uh, I left myself, uh, there were so many, uh, Carrick, all those top players and had great careers wherever they went. It, it's, it's, uh, yeah, it was, it's, it's a shame, but this is football, this is the beauty uh, of football as well. It's not like individual players that play, it's, it's a team and there's so much more than just talent. Uh, and, and I think that's what we have to reflect on. Frederick Omar Canute, I thank you very much for taking the opportunity. You're a great man, you're doing great work, and thanks so much, good chatting to you. Thank you, thank you for having me, thank you.